Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to do a rundown of everything I did on my 2004 Honda Element. This was the car that I bought in New Jersey. It was supposed to be for my sister. She didn't want it. I ended up doing a whole bunch of work to it. And then in the end, I sold it. So I'm going to go through step by step what I did, how much it cost, and my total profit on the vehicle. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Starting out, the initial price of this element was $2,000. The U-Haul trailer rental was $135, and gas both ways totaled to $200. When I picked it up, all that apparently needed was a front bumper and a VTEC solenoid connector. So I went to Gary's U Pull It in Binghamton, scoped out some bumpers, they were all duds but I was able to get some connectors. Total price for the connectors was $2. Before I started the engine work, I had to replace these really worn out hatch struts because I kept hitting my head and it was just super annoying. All I had to do for this was set up a six foot ladder so the tailgate wouldn't fall down. And then you pry back these little clips on the struts and pop them out. These new struts I'm using are made for a Volkswagen Beetle I believe it's 97 to 2010 with the spoiler. If you get the one without the spoiler, it doesn't have as much power going up and they wear out faster. These raise the tailgate an additional three inches. And let me tell you for $40, it's well worth it. I was getting code P2646, which is for the VTEC solenoid and it would not go over 3000 RPMs. So I took off the VTEC solenoid itself just to investigate. As I suspected, it was a brand new VTEC solenoid. Now the reason the person was selling this car is they replaced the engine for some reason, which I think I'll explain later on in the video. After they replaced the engine, it would not come out of limp mode. Two reasons for limp mode. One is usually it's an aftermarket solenoid, which was the case here. Or two, the pigtail connector was corroded, which I'm gonna test right now. I made a little discovery here with the VTEC, this is like the oil pressure switch connector that's usually the problem. If you hook a voltmeter up to it, there should be 12 volts going to it when the key is on. So I have the key on, the two ends of the voltmeter to that connector, and it's getting about 12 volts, which is what I want. That leads me to believe the connector's okay. All right. This connector is fine. It's got good voltage going to it. So I'm going to try now to clean this screen. I took off this VTEC screen, which is located right there. I had to take the power steering pump and the tensioner off. That's, I don't think that's clogged enough to set off a VTEC code and make it go into limp mode. But I'm just going to clean this and then put it back on. I've had this tensioner off three times now because the nut keeps falling off. It's on the back side. I think I found it. It goes down this crack here. All right, I got the nut out that fell down on top of the alternator. I had to go to Home Depot and buy a different size magnet. Got the tensioner, the power steering pump hooked back up. All right, so I was not planning on doing this today. But I found a junkyard in Rochester, which is about an hour and a half away. They just got in a 2004 yesterday, and it's got a really nice front bumper. I also need a VTEC solenoid. This is the one I got here yesterday. I'm going to take this front bumper. It's in like immaculate shape. I'll take the VTEC solenoid off this. I'm going to take the tires and wheels. These are in very good condition. Hopefully I'll be able to get that off. You can see here I did need tires because they were cracked and had edge wear. I'm also taking the remote because I need these. I got the front bumper off. I got the VTEC solenoid off. So I got these from the junkyard. They're in very good shape. 180 bucks for four tires with rims. The bumper was like 50 or so. I got the VTEC solenoid and four mud flaps. So the total for all was about 270. I'm back home working on the black element. And before I even drive it, 
I'm just going to swap out the VTEC solenoids. This is an aftermarket one. It's clearly not working. Believe it or not, this 20 year old OEM solenoid should work a lot better. I'm just going to change the gaskets because this one's all compressed and this one's pretty new. Well, I think I fixed the VTEC solenoid problem. It was the actual solenoid. I'll show you here. It'll actually get up to speed. I've done that about five times. No problems whatsoever. Now that the engine was running good, I went ahead and replaced the front bumper. I also had to take the fog lights out and swap them over to the new bumper. The aftermarket ones always turn white like that. It's an OEM, it's 20 years old, but it still looks like new. Right around this point, I was able to get my sister's car to pass inspection, and she drove the Element and didn't really like it. So we decided that I was going to sell this Element, and she was just going to keep driving her car for another year. I got the brightest LED yellow fog lights I could find on Amazon. They were $40, and I've installed these before, and I was very happy with them. It's pretty easy to replace the bulb. The hardest part is you have to take the bumper off to change the fog lights. Luckily, I was already doing that. On the new bumper, I just had to take a knife and cut out the template for where the fog lights would go. Then you simply push in the fog lights and screw them into place. Then I just hooked the bumper back up and went to test out the fog lights. I just got the fog lights done. It's so much brighter with the fogs. So I'll turn them on and off to show you the difference. Here is the stock halogen headlight bulbs. Fog lights. You can see it lights up to the side. Much better. Today I'm going to be restoring the headlight lenses and installing LED bulbs. I used the Cerakote kit from Amazon and it was 20 bucks. Here's some before and after pictures. Here are the new LED headlights I will be installing. Came with gloves, instructions, and I have these installed in one of the other elements and they work great. Here's a shot of the headlights installed. Tonight's task is to install the adjustable upper control arms so the back tires won't be tipped in like that. This is the driver's side brake in the back and this is the one that had the sticky caliper. I can't even spin the rotor right now even with the tire on it. So I'm going to take the caliper apart and see if I just have to grease it or if I have to replace the whole thing. I got the caliper off. Both the slider pins slide freely. And I tried to compress this with the big pair of channel locks and it did not compress. So I'm going to remove this caliper and install either one of the old ones I have that work or a brand new one. I will reuse this rotor. It looks like it's got grooves but it's actually smooth and the pads are in good shape still. This is an extra brake caliper that I have for my Element SC. I'm going to just reuse this one and I'll reuse the caliper bracket also. I got the caliper all back together. I greased the slide pins. I greased the pads where they connect. Tighten the brake line. Now I just have to bleed the system. This is the old brake fluid that came out. It should be clear to yellowish. While I was back here, I figured I would install the mud flap that I got from the junkyard. So this is the hardware you need. The plastic tab goes into here. And then I already drilled out the holes. There were little dimples where the holes had to be drilled and I'll put the mud flap on. Next up, I'm gonna change these upper control arms. So I have to disconnect this ABS wire, take this bolt off and this bolt off with a wrench because you can't fit a socket in there and the nut is welded i've made that mistake before this is a 17 millimeter bolt and this is how i have the wrench set up so i can get more leverage this is a very slow and steady process all right i got this control arm off what happens is these bushings wear out over time and all of the bushings wear out over time. And that's why the rear wheels tip in. So what I'll do is I'll take the adjustable one and I'll set it to just slightly longer than this. So it's as close as it can be for the alignment. I took 
these new adjustable control arms apart because I want to put anti-seize on all the threads. I'll tell you right now, I'm not that happy with the quality of these. The threads don't extend long enough into the center here compared to the TRQ ones from 1A Auto that I typically use. And this is much smaller. Everything is like much smaller and more cheaply made. It was also half the price, so I figured I would try it. This is how I adjusted them. You see these bolts will line up and here the new one's just a little bit longer. There aren't many teeth going into this, so hopefully it holds up. Okay, I got this bolt almost all the way tight. I'm going to keep it loose because I'm going to want to tighten it in the position where the suspension is loaded. So I'll, I'll end up jacking the rotor up. As soon as the car picks off the jack stand, then I will tighten it down at that position because I don't want the bushing to be twisted in there. I have the jack lifting up the rotor which is compressing the spring and putting the control arm at the correct angle. So now I'll take the 17 millimeter, tighten that bolt, and then I'll be good to put the tire on. I've now got the driver's side done. I got the tire on, the control arm, the mud flap, fix the brake caliper. I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side with the mud flap and the control arm. The caliper was okay over there. Here's the passenger side. The rotor's good. Pads are good. I got the new control arm in. The goal today is to replace the tie rod ends and the ball joint. At least this one. Hopefully not the other one too. So I'm going to start with knocking this little indented tab back and then unscrewing this at the 36 millimeter. Now I'm going to give this a tap in to hopefully, oh look, it's not a rusty car, so it just pushes right in. My black element, I was like wailing on this axle for days and it would not budge. And this one doesn't have any rust, popped right through. So next I will take the strut bolts off. I'm going to take this ball joint nut off and I have to take the cotter pin off first. I got most of this undone. The only thing that's stuck is the ball joint into the control arm. So I'm going to try to pry that out with the pry bar or something. At this point, the ball joint was not coming out for anything. I had the pickle fork in there. That wasn't working. I was trying to heat it up. Well, I finally got the knuckle off. I had to use my neighbor's pickle fork because mine wasn't big enough. So now I got to get this pickle fork off and then press out this old ball joint. Here's the old in the new ball joint. It's the triple five. You can get these at Napa and online. I got the new ball joint in. I just pushed it in by hand actually. I greased up where it was gonna slide in. It just slid in and then I put this new snap ring on. After I got the knuckle installed, the next day I did the tie rod ends. I got them from AutoZone for about $65. Got the tie rod installed, now I'm gonna put on the mud flap. Now to the driver's side, the ball joint looks okay, so I'm just going to do the tie rod end, which is clearly worn out. I decided to take a closer look at this ball joint, and I can see now that it's in the air, it's cracking. The rubber's cracking, so I just went to Napa and I got another one, and I'll do the driver's side. I got this knuckle off, I just have to loosen this pickle fork because it got stuck in the ball joint. And then I'll be able to press the old one out and push the new one in. This is the looseness of that driver's side ball joint. I'm very glad I replaced it. These should be like very difficult to move. I'll show you the new one once it's installed. I got the new ball joint installed. As you can see, it's much harder to move around. All right, tie rod end is installed. Mud flap is installed. I reconnected the ABS wire, put the caliper back on, tighten the strut bolts, and tighten the ball joint. So now I'm gonna put the tire back on and take it for a test drive. So this is not good. I was just cleaning up the garage and I noticed there's water on the floor and it's overheating. I could have swore both the fans were working. Let me pop the hood and look. 
So the overflow was spilling out. The fans, the fans are not spinning. Let me turn the air on. See if the fans go on. Now the fans are spinning. So after the little incident last night overheating, I'm going to pop the radiator cap open and then drain all the old antifreeze out. It was not Honda fluid to begin with, so I was going to change it anyways. Also, the fans only turned on when I had the air conditioning on. It should turn on when once it gets to a certain temperature if the air is not on. So I got to figure that out, but I'm going to start with the coolant. Luckily, this isn't a milkshake yet, but it is green coolant and I want to have Honda blue in it. I was ready to put the radiator cap back on and I noticed I need a new one. So I'm gonna go get a new radiator cap. Well, you guys will like this one. I have to drain the coolant out again. The new coolant I just put in. It turns out the cooling fan problem, why it didn't come on yesterday and it started to overheat, is there's a switch on the bottom of the radiator, but in order to remove it, you gotta drain the coolant. So here's another update for you. I reinstalled that coolant I drained out even before I put the new coolant temperature switch in. I did that because I need to get this aligned on Tuesday, today Sunday, and the part is not going to be in until Tuesday, and the timing just won't work out, so I have to get it aligned first. So I put the old coolant in, I'll just leave the AC on if I come to a stop, and then later on I'll install the switch. I just took it for a drive to warm up the transmission fluid. I'm gonna do a drain and fill on that. So the transmission fluid change is actually easier than changing your oil. You just come right here. You don't even have to jack the car up and loosen this. It's a 3 8 drive you just put on there. I broke it free, now you just have to untwist it. I should have done this first, but I'm gonna come up here and pull the dipstick. So it starts draining out faster. And I just heard it. It's coming out a lot faster now. Should've done that first. Here is the metallic drain plug. A lot of metal shavings on this. This is all the metal shavings that came off of the drain bolt. It's nothing to be worried about. It's totally normal. Uh, but that's why this is here, so it catches it. This is the transmission fluid I'll use. They sell this at AutoZone and it actually is Honda transmission fluid. This is the company that makes it for Honda. This was like 15 bucks at AutoZone. I just got it because it's Sunday and the Honda dealer is closed. It's, it's gonna take about 3.3 quarts. So I'll use the three I bought here and then the third left over from another car. I got the drain bolt back installed. This is the funnel I use. I got it from AutoZone a few years ago. I put that 3.3 quarts in, check the fluid level, and it's right at the top where it should be. Next up, I'm going to change the engine air filter. This is held on by four 10 millimeter bolts. I take it back, these are actually 8 millimeter bolts. This is the old air filter. Somebody's changed it recently. It's really not bad at all. So I'm going to take the new one I bought back to the store. Well, I came in here to change the cabin air filters, and I'm really worried what I'm going to find. That does not look normal. I think a mouse put that there. And inside, it's not supposed to be white and fluffy. And I'm kind of worried there's like dead mice. So I'm gonna pull this open with a pair of pliers. That one's not bad. Well, it is bad, it's packed full, but no dead mice. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. I gotta get the vacuum cleaner out. Here's the old and the new cabin air filters. Now I'm gonna take off this terrible window tint. But you can see it's really bad and it's like super blurry and hard to see out of. You can already see how much clearer it is without the tint. I got the glue scraped off both the windows. It is so much better now. Now that the windows are clean, I'm going to install these AVS in-channel vent shades. Rain guards are installed. It was pretty self-explanatory how to install them. 
Next up, I checked the spare tire pressure. It only had 15 PSI. I also tightened up the netting on the back of the seats. The rear wiper blade was completely worn off, so I got a new one for about 10 bucks. I also noticed the front wipers were totally shot. So I went to Walmart and I got two wipers and a few other things while I was there. And I actually changed the wipers in the parking lot because they were so bad. Before I put the new tires on that I got from the junkyard, I had to clean them up a little bit. I used my drill brush, pressure washer, some car wash soap. That really didn't get them that clean. The brake dust was literally baked into the clear coat and into the paint of the rims. So I actually found some wheel cleaner, it's red stuff. I tried that, it didn't really work. It helped a little bit, but the wheels were still corroded and dirty looking. So I ended up painting them. I started by sanding all of them down the best I could. Just so you know, my hands were in a lot of pain doing this. Then I sectioned off the rims from the tires with some scrap paper and started spray painting. I used about two cans of spray paint. I did three coats per rim. They were about five bucks a can. Then I just lined up the center cap so the H is lined up with the valve stem, just as it was from the factory. And before I knew it, they looked like they were brand new. I then took it in for an alignment and I was able to go underneath from the lift and get a good view of how rust free it actually was. <laughs> Gotta get on my YouTube page. Oh, First he adjusted the rear camber to negative one degrees. Then he had to get the impact out to break the tow bolt loose. After he did the passenger side, he went to the driver's side. Moving up front, he had to use a torch to break the jam nut loose on the tie rod end. But after that, he was able to align the front perfectly straight. Every must have for a Honda Element is these blind spot circle mirrors. It really helps, especially when the seats are folded up so you can see cars to your side. I got the new radiator fan switch from Honda, and then I came across the street to AutoZone to get a 24 millimeter deep socket so I could remove the old one. Here's the old one. It had like a bunch of goo on it. I bet I could have cleaned it and it would have worked, but I got the new one so I installed it. Next I adjusted the valves, and I could tell by the valve cover gasket how it was cracking that it was probably never done before, or at least the gasket was never changed. So it really cost me about 15 bucks just for the gasket. The valves were very, very tight. Next up, this battery was really weak. So I changed it out for a 24F battery, which is the common element upgrade. It really makes a world of a difference. And it's much bigger battery. Here's a size comparison between the 51R and the bigger 24F. Just throw out the old plastic trays and the old tie down and then bend the tabs on the metal tray down and it'll fit right into place. While I had the battery out, I also looked at the ground wire. This one is still in good shape. These are the tabs that the new tie down attaches to. And here's a picture of the tie down kit. I got it at Advance Auto. I should also mention that I got the battery for free and here's a difference in the cold cranking amps. Now that I thought everything was fixed, I started cleaning it. After I vacuumed, I shampooed all four seats. And let me tell you, the water that came out was disgusting. I use a Bissell Spot Clean Professional with drill brushes and the soap I used was actually fabuloso. It smelled like my mother just did laundry after I was done cleaning this car. Like a nice, beautiful spring day. This was the front passenger seat and it still amazes me to this day how people let their cars get so dirty. I got this nasty seat cover from the junkyard to cover up the cracks in the seat and it actually did come clean. Before I put the seat cover on, I covered the rips and cracks with tape just so they won't spread. Then I just went around and cleaned the rest of the inside with Fabuloso. Now, unfortunately, I was out of toaster grease, so I had to resort to 50-50 boiled linseed oil and mineral spirits to restore the plastics. It did an okay job, but the toaster grease is definitely better. I had a ticket I had to use up at Watkins Glen, so I decided, why not take the element? I made a whole video on this, and one of my YouTube subscribers actually reached out 
and said that he wanted to buy this element. We agreed on a price, so all we had to do was wait for the title to come in. I had a slight vibration in the front that kept getting worse, and I went to get the tires balanced, but I saw axle grease all over the place. So I knew I had to get a new axle. Now I said before that this ball joint seemed loose when I installed it. Somehow the knuckle must be just a little bit bigger than normal and the fit was not tight enough. So what I had to do was replace it with a ball joint with these splines on it and that pressed in nice and tight. I was having a lot of trouble getting the passenger side CV axle off. I was trying to hit it with the socket like I normally do, but it was just too stuck on. So I had to remove the intermediate shaft. And then once I got it on the ground, I was able to hit it with different size sockets until the two shafts separated. The outer joint on the old CV axle was very, very stiff. And the new one that I bought from eBay was very flexible. The front sway bar links were not making noise yet. But upon further inspection, the boots were ripped, so I just went ahead and replaced them anyways. And of course, everything was super rusted on, so I had to use my angle grinder. Now, unfortunately, I had a very small EVAP leak check engine light come on towards the end of the work. I decided to check the gas cap. There was that little hairline crack in it, so I just swapped the gas cap from another element, and it did go away. In the couple months that I had this car, I put about 5,000 miles on it. So I went ahead and changed the oil, even though the maintenance required light was not on yet. The seller said he was going to get this car rust proofed, but just in case he had to drive it in the salt before then, I went ahead and sprayed the control arm mounts. And finally, I took another seat cover out of a different element and put it in this one. So I'd have a matching driver and passenger. And just like that, the new owner came, test drove it, and bought it and drove it away. Adding everything up, which I had not done until just now when I'm editing the video, the total I spent was $3,646, plus about $150 on gas, going to different junkyards and back and forth and back and forth to the auto parts store. And keep in mind all the hours and hours that I spent in the garage and driveway working on this car. So I figure I had about 3800 into it and I sold it for $6,000. Thank you for watching.